World History Chapter 18, The Developing World. After World War II, a central goal in Africa, Asia, and Latin America was development, or creating a more advanced economy and higher living standards. Nations that are working toward this are referred to as the developing world. They are also called the Global South because most of these nations are south of the Tropic of Cancer. Most industrialized nations are north of the Tropic of Cancer, so they are sometimes called the Global North. Nations of the Global South have tried to develop economically by improving their agriculture and industry. They have also built schools to increase literacy. <clears throat> to, de uh, to pay for development, many countries in the Global South procured large loans from industrialized nations. For centuries, most people in the Global South had lived and worked in traditional economies. After gaining independence from European countries, some of these countries experimented with government-led command economies. However, when these countries had trouble paying off their loans, lenders from the Global North required many of them to change to market economies. Now, many developing nations depend on the Global North for investment and exports. The Green Revolution. Beginning in the 1950s, improved seeds, pesticides, and mechanical equipment led to a green revolution in many parts of the developing world. This increased agricultural production, feeding many more people. It also benefited large landowners at the expense of small farmers. These farmers sold their land and moved to cities. Challenges. The Global South still faces many challenges. Some developing nations produce only one export product. If prices for that product drop, their economies suffer. Poverty. Also, the population in many of these countries has grown rapidly. Many people are caught in a cycle of poverty. When families are forced to move to cities, they often find only low-paying jobs. As a result, many children must work to help the support their families. With so many moving to cities, many people are forced to live in crowded and dangerous shanty towns. You can see some examples here. Once again, this is what we tend to see located on the outskirts of many major cities in the Global South. Advances for Women Economic development has brought great cha changes to the developing world. In many countries, women have greater equality. However, some religious fundamentalists oppose these changes and have called for a return to the basic values of their faiths. Africa seeks a better future. After World War II, African nations had little capital to invest, so they had to make difficult economic choices. Some nations chose socialism, a system in which the government controls parts of the economy. The leaders of these governments had hoped to end foreign influence in their countries and to close the gap between the rich and the poor. However, socialism sometimes led to large, inefficient bureaucracies. Capitalism. Other nations relied on capitalism or market economies. These economies were often more efficient, but foreign owners of businesses took profits out of the country. Some governments tried to fund development by growing crops for export rather than food crops. However, this forced them to import food to replace the food crops. Governments then had to subsidize part of the cost of importing food from overseas. Desertification African nations faced many obstacles to development. Droughts led to famine in parts of Africa, and this was especially true in the Sahel, where overgrazing and farming led to desertification. Here we have a look at life expectancy around the world. Now, what you see is the dark green areas, particularly Japan, uh, Australia, and a few other isolated countries uh, in Europe. 
the life expectancy is 80 plus in the United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, Chile and Argentina, and most of Western Europe, life expectancy is 75 plus. The yellow areas, which includes a lot of South America, a few areas in Central America, uh, some North African countries, most of Eastern Europe, and parts of Asia, life expectancy would be 70 plus. The orange is 60 plus. And as you move into darker reds, 50 plus or under 50 in the darkest red. And so you can see uh, some areas or pockets that are darker red, especially in Africa. This is a look at the population growth by percent. And so, once again, what you see is that uh, if we look at North America in the United States and Canada, uh, the population growth is between 0 and 1%. And that is consistent with most of Western Europe and also uh, parts of Asia and um, also Australia few isolated parts of Africa. The purple areas have less than 0% population growth. That means they actually have a negative population growth. So their population is, is probably slowly reducing. Uh, in other words, there are more, more people passing on or pass away than are born. Uh, the birth rate doesn't keep up with the death rate. And uh, those are in the, the purple countries. Now in the light blue, the uh, population growth is at 1%. The green, it's at 2%. And the yellow is at 3%. And the only places really you see the yellow are in, uh, well, for the most part, on the African continent. Uh, a little bit uh, down here. Uh, on the end of the Arabian Peninsula, or yeah, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Yemen looks like. Um, you know, a lot of Africa is in the green at two percent. So they do have a higher population growth than most of the developed world. And this looks at the infant mortality rate per one thousand births. Um, once again, you see very similar patterns. North America, the United States, and Canada look the same. Uh, the infant mortality rate per 1,000 births is under 10. And what that means, if you don't know what that means, that, that means that basically for every 1,000 um, live births, or you know, infants that are born, um, 10 or fewer die uh, in infancy. Uh, if you look at Mexico, Mexico is in the 10 to 30 range, so they're a little higher, and most of South America falls in that uh, same category. Um, few isolated parts of Central and South America are a little higher in the 30 to 60. Uh, as you look at Europe, Europe's once again very similar to the United States in the 0 to 10. Uh, for most of Europe, some parts of Europe are in the 10 to 30. Um, as we look at Asia, most of Asia, um, northern Asia, is going to be mostly in the 10 to 30 or 30 to 60. Um, as you get down into southern Asia, southeast Asia, uh, the numbers start increasing. And you know, if you look at Af Africa, the African continent, um, really the countries with the lowest infant mortality rate are, are fairly rare. Uh, but you see a lot of the dark, the 90 to 130, and even a few in the 130 plus. So, um, you know, the infant mortality rate overall in Africa is much higher than that in most developed countries. HIV AIDS. This is a, a major issue affecting Africa. 25 million of the 38 million infected with AIDS live in Africa. 8% of the adult population is infected, 
and at least 12 million have been orphaned as a result of the disease. Now remember, when we say orphaned, that doesn't mean they lost one parent. That means they basically have ended up losing both parents to the disease. And here's life expectancy in aged ravaged southern African countries. And you can see it's pretty consistent um, in terms of the life expectancy. Um, now what we've seen here is if you look at this, the life expectancy was going up in all these countries. Uganda kind of started to drop off in the early 70s and leveled off a little bit and then began to drop a little bit more. The other countries, life expectancy was increasing until we got into the 1980s, and that's really about the time that we, you know, the AIDS epidemic was really uh, starting to become well known, and especially in Africa. And you can see how the life expectancies have plummeted there as a result. Okay, problems facing new nations: dependence on a single cash crop. Like we said before, a lot of developing nations may rely upon only one cash crop. If something happens that you know they have a bad year for that particular crop for some reason, um, you know they're totally dependent on it. They can't easily replace it. Profits leaving the country. Once again, that oftentimes for developing countries is a problem because foreign investors may invest in that country, but they pull the profits out. Natural resources misspent. That's something that is you know very common. Rapid population growth, the highest in the world, is in these developing nations. Drought and famine are another huge problem. Political instability and war are also common in these developing nations. Now we're going to look at Latin America since 1945. And here we have a timeline. So we'll start here looking at 1946. Juan Perón establishes an authoritarian regime in Argentina. In 1948, the Organization of American States is formed, or the OAS. In 1951, Juan Perón is elected to a second term as the president of Argentina. In 1959, Fidel Castro seizes power in Cuba. In 1961, the Bay of Pigs invasion fails. 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis is resolved. 1967, Che Guevara dies in Bolivia. 1989, the United States invades Panama. 1990, Violeta Barrios de Chamorro is elected president of Nicaragua. Uh, 2000, Vicente Fox becomes the president of Mexico. And in 2002, the Brazilians elect Lulu president. Okay, economic and political developments. Although Latin American economies had become more self-sufficient during the Great Depression, they remained fragile. They were too reliant on the world prices for raw goods and were especially dependent on American business investment. American business investment in Latin America led to much U.S. intervention into Latin American political and social affairs. For example, the United Fruit Company, based in Boston, acted as a state within a state in Guatemala. When Guatemalan president Jacobo Arbanes seized some of United Fruit's property, the company convinced the U.S. government to help conservative forces in Guatemala to overthrow Arbanes. In 1948, the Organization of American States was formed. The OAS emphasized the need for Latin American independence. The OAS did not lead to the end of U.S. intervention in Latin America, this was mainly due to the fear of communism during the Cold War era. The U.S. kept a close watch on radical movements in Latin America and provided massive amounts of military aid to anti-communist regimes friendly to U.S. business interests, even if it meant backing dictators. Radical social and political movements appealed to many in Latin America because of the weak economies which led to unstable governments. Dictators were able to take power during times of worker unrest because they had the support of the military and the conservative elites. Dictatorial regimes often encouraged multinational corporations to invest in Latin America, increasing their nation's dependence on industrialized nations. 
In the 1970s, Latin American countries began borrowing money from other nations. As the debt grew, economies crumbled, and, and soon many nations could not even pay the interest on their loans. This drove them to the international organizations like the World Bank, who would loan the money only if certain reforms were made. Recurring economic crises led to the demand for democracy because some military leaders did not want to deal with the debt problem and because people recognized that a dictator could not create a strong state without popular support. The new democracies faced tough challenges with not only the economies but also with the strong drug trade in Latin America. Rapid population growth caused by a high birth rate exacerbated Latin America's economic problems. In 1950, the Latin American population was roughly 165 million. By the mid-1980s, it had grown to 400 million. By 2000, 50 cities in Latin America and the Caribbean had more than a million people, many of whom are recent arrivals who live in slums or shanty towns. Here we have a look at the population of Latin America between 1950 and projected out to 2020. Um, when this was done, with, I think this graphic was probably done around 2005. Uh, the, what we saw for 2010 was a projection, and 2020 also was a, uh, is a projection. Uh, but you can see where it was at 166 million. In 1950, it went up to 218 by 1960, 286 by 1970, 362 by 1980, 443 by 1990, 520 by the year 2000. It was projected to hit uh, 586 by 2010 and 645 in 2020. Many Latin American cities are huge. Mexico City, the world's largest, has more than 18 million inhabitants, as compared to 8 million in New York City. Mega cities such as Mexico City and Rio de Janeiro have grown up so fast that housing, water supplies, and schools cannot keep up. As a result, many residents live in favelas, or squatter settlements lacking in basic infrastructure. Latin American societies are marked by an enormous gap between the rich and the poor. Latin American writers and artists have been granted a high public status because they can express the hopes of the people and their criticisms of government. In literature, Latin Americans developed magic realism, a merging of realistic events with dreamlike or fantastic backgrounds. The novel 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez is one of the foremost examples of a work written in this style. In 1982, Marquez was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. In art, <coughs> abstract forms dominated. In architecture, boho and modernist styles were seen. Brasilia, Brazil, designed mostly by Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer, reflects this modern aesthetic. And here we have a look at some of the economic challenges in Latin America. They're dependent on the US, Europe, and Japan. They have export-import economies that are financed by foreigners, the presence of multinational corporations, low wages with high inflation, and growing foreign debt. The Mexican way. Mexico differs from many other Latin American countries in that it has a relatively stable democratic government and it is more industrialized. Yet, they are too dependent on foreign loans. Also, most Mexicans are poor, leading to large amounts of legal and illegal immigration to the United States. For most of the 20th century, the official political party in Mexico was the institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI. This was the party of the Mexican Revolution of 1911. By the 1960s, students began to challenge the PRI's monopoly, leading to reforms including the formation of new political parties. In 2000, 
Vicente Fox defeated the PRI candidate in the presidential election. So far, Fox has been unable to make the changes that he promised, but he did initiate talks with President Bush concerning immigration. The Cuban Revolution. In the 1950s, an opposition movement arose in Cuba, led by Fidel Castro. Its aim was to overthrow dictator Fulgencio Batista. Castro's revolutionaries gained control of Havana in 1959. Many Cubans disagreed with Castro and fled to the United States. Relations between the United States and Cuba quickly deteriorated as Castro began to receive aid from the Soviet Union and arms from Eastern Europe. In October of 1960, the United States declared a trade embargo, prohibiting trade with Cuba. In January of 1961, the United States broke diplomatic relations with Cuba. In April of 1961, U.S. President John F. Kennedy supported an attempt to overthrow Castro's government. The attempt failed. The Soviets then placed missiles in Cuba, leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban economy relied on Soviet aid and the purchase of Cuban sugar by Soviet bloc countries. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba lost its support. Cuba's economy has continued to decline. And here we have a map of Central America. So here you can see the countries that make up Central America. You have Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. Upheaval in Central America. The economies of Central American countries rely on the export of bananas, coffee, and cotton. Prices for these goods have var varied over time, causing economic crises. The gap between the rich and the poor in Central America causes instability. The fear of the spread of communism in the region caused the United States to support repressive regimes. In the late 1970s and 1980s, El Salvador had a bitter civil war. During Ronald Reagan's presidency, the United States gave military aid to the Salvadoran army to defeat the Marxist-led guerrillas. Finally, in 1992, a peace settlement ended the war. In 1937, the Somoza family gained and kept control of Nicaragua until 1979. The United States supported this repressive regime. In 1979, the United States refused to support the regime any longer. Marxist guerrilla forces, known as Sandinistas, gained control of Nicaragua. The Contras, a group opposed to the Sandinistas, tried to overthrow the government. The Reagan and Bush administration supported the Contras. In 1990, the Sandinistas agreed to free elections. In 1903, the United States helped Panama gain independence from Colombia. In return, the United States gained control of the Panama Canal and great influence over the government and economy of Panama. After 1968, military leaders controlled power in Panama. In 1989, the United States sent troops to Panama to arrest its military leader, Manuel Noriega, who was later sent to prison in the United States for drug trafficking. In 1999, the Panama Canal was turned over to Panama as outlined in a 1977 treaty. Uh, pictured here, you can see this is Panama and its location. It was, here's Colombia, and it was part of Colombia prior to the building of the canal. Uh, so the U.S. supported Panama's independence from Colombia to gain access to the 10-mile-wide uh, easement needed to make the Panama Canal. And here you can see then-President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind as they passed through the Panama Canal. And Carter was the one that, that uh, was responsible for negotiating this 1977 treaty by which the United States agreed to turn over the, uh, the canal by the year 2000. And we did turn it over to Panama on December 31st, 1999. Brazil, the Colossus of Latin America. After World War II, Brazil's democratically elected governments were unable to solve the country's severe economic problems. In 1964, the military seized control of Brazil. 
The military reduced government interference in the economy and stressed free market forces. Brazil's economy grew dramatically. The gap between the rich and the poor of Brazil widened. The inflation rate grew to 100% a year. The military regime was replaced by a return to democracy in 1985. A massive foreign debt, severe inflation, and a lack of social unity faced the new democratic government. In the 1990s, a series of democratically elected presidents led to some stability in Brazil's economy. Argentina and Chile. For years, Argentina was ruled by a powerful oligarchy. In 1943, a group of military officers overthrew the oligarchy. Juan Perón used his position as labor secretary in the military government to win over the working class. He encouraged them to join labor unions and he increased job benefits. Juan Perón was elected president of Argentina in 1946. To please his main supporters, labor and the working middle class, Perón increased industrialization. He worked to rid Argentina of foreign investors. His regime was authoritarian. The Falkland Islands. Perón died in 1974. A new military regime took power in 1976. To divert people's attention from the economic problems, the regime invaded the Falkland Islands but was defeated by Great Britain. In 1983, Raul Alfonsín was elected president of Argentina and worked to restore democratic practices. In 1989, Carlos Sol Menem won the presidential election. The peaceful transfer of power gave rise to hope for democracy in Argentina. In 1970, Marxist Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. He increased the wages of industrial workers and nationalized the largest domestic-owned corporations. Here you can see the stamp here depicts Salvador Allende, and here he is with uh, Cuban leader Fidel Castro. And here you see uh, the uh, former president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, who uh, just passed away last year, uh, holding up a flag with Allende's picture on it. Nationalization of the copper industry angered American owners of the copper company, or yeah, of the copper companies in the American government. In 1973, fearful of Allende's growing support, the Chilean army, led by General Augusto Pinochet, overthrew Allende's government. The military set up a dictatorship with Pinochet as its leader. Pinochet's government was one of the most brutal in Chile's history. In 1989, free elections led to the defeat of Pinochet and a more democratic system. Colombia and Peru. The history of Peru's government is one of instability. The economy has a history of extreme ups and downs. In 1968, General Juan Velasco Alvarado took over Peru's government. He seized about 75% of the nation's large landed estates and put ownership of the land into the hands of peasant cooperatives, farm organizations owned by and operated for the peasants' benefits. In 1975, Peruvian military leaders removed Alvarado from power. In 1980, the military returned Peru to civilian rule. The new government had problems with the Shining Path, a group of radical guerrillas with ties to communist China who killed missionaries, mayors, priests, and peasants. They wanted to rid Peru of all authority and to create a classless society. In June of 2001, Alejandro Toledo became Peru's first freely elected president of Native American descent. A conservative elite, led by the owners of coffee plantations, has dominated Colombia's democratic political system. After World War II, Marxist guerrilla groups began to organize Colombian peasants. The government killed more than 200,000 peasants by the mid-1960s. Violence continued through the 1980s and 1990s. <clears throat> Poor peasants turned cocoa leaves used to make cocaine as a cash crop. 
the drug trade increased under powerful cartels. The United States and Colombian governments have waged an aggressive war on drugs. High unemployment continues to stifle economic growth, and in 2002, Alvaro Uribe won a landslide presidential victory and has taken a hard line against guerrilla rebels. Uh, the pictures here on the left are both of uh, the famed Colombian drug lord, Pablo Escobar. And here you can see uh, he was the head of the Medellin cartel, uh, one of the two big cartels. The other would be the Cali cartel. And uh, here you can see people, part of the search party that was responsible for tracking him down, uh, posing with the body. And here we have a look at some of the different uh, countries, just to kind of summarize, looking at the country, the conflict, the revolution, change, and cooperation that has come. In Cuba, corruption and canceled elections create unrest. Castro ousts Batista. Castro improves the social welfare system, but suspends elections. And Castro allows limited foreign investment, improving relations with Canada and other countries. Nicaragua. The repressive Somoza regime owns a quarter of the country's land. The revolution, a social movement led by Sandinistas, overthrows the Somoza in 1979. The Sandinistas initiate social reforms but are hampered by the Contras. Sandinista regime agrees to hold free elections in 1990, and Chamorro is elected president. Mexico, the PRI dominates. University students protest government policies. The PRI allows new political parties and more freedoms. And Mexico elects non-PRI candidate as president. Argentina. The economy is poor. Argentine military overthrows Perón. The economy recovers. Many citizens lose lives to death squads. Democracy is gradually restored after the Falkland Islands disaster. El Salvador. The elites control most of the wealth and land. Leftist guerrillas and right-wing groups battle. UN-sponsored peace agreement ends the Civil War in 1992, and the economy grows. Ties with neighbors are renewed.